Finland Saga, Season 2, Episode 9. Last we left that Thorfinn was heading into an abyss. His own personal hell. There's something very Attack on Titan about this. I had the weirdest dream. Birds. Speaking of which. Oh, enjoy this moment of peace. Wouldn't that be... Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, these are the kind of dreams that hurt like hell to wake up from. At least it's an upgrade from his usual dreams. It's possible. It's possible. Peace is possible. Oh no. <laughs> Not the transition though. That transition was so great and terrible. Oh, it's awful. He's just out? He's just knocked out. He's gone. Wow, maybe he should get knocked out more often. Here's a really difficult rhetorical question based on that dream. If the events of season one had never happened and Thorfinn lived the life he was just dreaming about, would that have been a good thing? It's a difficult question to answer because, of course, it would mean that all the terrible things we've seen him go through would not have taken place. He would not be currently living in this hell. On the other hand, and optimistically speaking, while there's nothing really to celebrate in the carnage itself, and truly a lot of terrible things have happened, is there not something valuable about his, his journey? Is it not a greater pathway in some sense to his full potential? Did he not receive something like a destiny through the events that unfolded in his childhood? I don't wish pain on anyone and I don't wish for destruction, but I also feel like there are existential dangers of an over abundance of peace as well, or an overabundance of luxury. Optimistically speaking, struggle itself create the parameters for what I think a lot of people are craving, which is adventure or growth through struggle. Perhaps one variable that would be useful in answering that question is seeing what Thorfinn goes on to accomplish. If he takes all of this pain, all of this trauma, all of these negative events of his life and channels it into something heroic, that will in some sense contextualize his past and his pain into something that could actually be really grand and beautiful. Oh, we were in the middle of this battle still. I, I, like, I'm so curious to see the fall, fallout of this. They made a big move. That was a big move. <laughs> There's just some chance. It's a very small chance. This leads to some mutual respect. We can shake hands and have a drink. After, after this. A afterwards. Get it all out. Let's hash this out. Like I said, if we're going to do it, let's do it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got a, I got prior commitments. I'm a little busy. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's not that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. What a surprise! These guys resulted to pettiness instead of honor. Perhaps. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> We'll see, I guess. I mean, he won a certain victory for himself. He stood up to his aggressors and definitely made a bold statement. He had his bro Thorfinn's back. Thorfinn had his back. That's valuable. That's something. Considering that no lasting damage was done to others, I'll give him a W for that. What makes me less fearful and helps a lot in this circumstance is that he's well-liked. He's well-respected. The circumstances of your actions vary so greatly depending on who you are as a whole and how people feel about you. If you have been upstanding and you've worked to develop your character and other people recognize that about you, you get a lot more leeway than you would otherwise. Einar's a pretty upstanding dude. He seems well liked. Thorfinn doesn't really rock the boat, but on that I think his image also is positive. Because he keeps to himself, he doesn't cause problems usually, and he works hard. He's reliable in that way. Compare the retainers, right? They're kind of sniveling. Nobody really seems to like them. They are more of like a necessary evil for security. They are opportunistic and vile, and you know, that would be more dangerous if they actually commanded power, but they haven't amassed any power for themselves either. They're laborers, as much as they don't want to admit it. In fact, that understanding, that self-knowledge, at least subconsciously, is a big part of what leads to their resentment of these two. But what about the chasm? What about the crevasse? Episode 9, Oath. Oh, he's still in this dreamland. Oh, wow. It's coming back, the thing he's forgotten. Oh, this is... this is... This is heartbreaking. There's a lamb which makes you think there's going to be some kind of sacrifice. Oh my... Rejected by... rejected by his image of his father. Which makes total sense. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, imagine sitting in front of your father like this. Yeah, he left a little bit too soon. Wow. Took all this, this whole whole crazy journey just to come back to, to where it started. Yeah, literally dragging him down. Still carrying that weight. Oh, to have Thor's witness is just so so unbelievably painful. And dragging Thor's down. And down we go again. Oh. What a beautiful, terrible, horrifying, but great visualization. He's still like hanging on, like, he's still fighting. I mean, literally hanging on. He could sink, like this is a real danger for Thorfinn. He could just disappear into that forever. And this is all him. Like everything he's seeing is just him. It's a really interesting subversion of Valhalla. The place everyone wants to go. There's just so much. I and mean, firstly, that image we keep seeing of him going into the house and seeing Einar's face seems that that was a real event and that he's now putting Einar's face on it because Einar talked about his family being killed and him making that kind of emotional connection. Him standing in front of Thor's, meeting his father face to face again is just such a great choice for so many reasons. I mean, it was the thing that he was burying. It was the thing that was forgotten. It was our first introduction to like a high ideal or the highest ideal, at least at the time, that Thorfinn's anger and bloodlust, desire for revenge, totally subverted. All was lost in that moment and he needed something, anything to get him moving, to keep him going. And revenge is just a low hanging fruit. It's also really amazing to think about it in terms of a dream sequence because it's Thor's, but it's not really Thor's. It's Thorfinn talking to himself. Thor's, I imagine, would actually be really sympathetic and would embrace his son. He would likely be very saddened by the events of his life, but he'd be able to see the whole picture. And Thor's himself went down that road and got out of it. So a real reunion would have been a lot more sympathetic, a lot more loving. But when Asklad, of all people, gave him the gift of something like a freedom, you know, disrupting that whole revenge as life's purpose and meaning, the same thing happened again where Thorfinn needed to go towards something. And he's been holding off. That's why he called himself empty. There's nothing to fill it, but then what do you know? The ideals from which we began come creeping back in and taking root and giving so much more context on everything that happened to him. That's the nature of things sometimes where you travel a long way just to end up in the same place, but it's not the same place really, or at least your understanding of it is so much deeper. And you maybe had to go down that route. You can't understand things before you understand them. And unfortunately or fortunately, sometimes that means going to hell first, you know, going to hell and back to assess the stream on a more personal level. I understand this this false image of a parental figure or, or a loved one, because I too, there are a lot of things I think about that I want to accomplish in my mind for the benefit of people I really care about to the point where it brings great fear of not being able to accomplish them. And to some extent, I think it's positive because I can take that energy, I can use that energy as a driving force. On the other hand, looking at it objectively, I'm aware of the fact that that's not really what anybody wants for me. They don't want me to suffer under the weight of having to please someone else or become something for them, but rather to be me, be well-adjusted, be a solid person, make the most of my life in a very authentic and individual way. So their voices, their images are really me. They are them run through the lens of my own my own fears, as well as my own hopes and dreams. And then finally, this is such a great subversion of Valhalla. This feels like a total awakening for Thorfinn. It wouldn't feel this way, but it's it's such a blessing. He's out, you know, he he got out of it. He can look down at the thing people are obsessed with, the, the level of life, the kind of superficial thing that people just never really move beyond, that is something like just default belief that probably was made by someone else. Like who made the idea of like dying in battle for Valhalla? Maybe some of that is authentic to the individual. A lot of it is probably just encouraging people to fight and die, you know? How many people stay there their whole lives? What a gift. What a painful gift. It's like a, a lot of times, at first insight is a curse or it feels like a curse. Still hanging on. Hanging by his busted fingernails. That's a familiar face. I wonder how many faces I just missed. <laughs> Oh, we're all here. Everyone's here. I wonder how he'll project Asclad in hell form. Someone who mocks him. Makes sense. Accurate. <laughs> Actually, it's pretty accurate. Yo. 
and we're just going through them one by one, all the figures. Dad number one in heaven and dad number two in hell. At least it's not dull. Makes a valid point. It's interesting that Aslet is somewhat, you know, removed from it. Total opposite of what Thor said. No one is your enemy and everyone is your enemy. I think this is Thorfinn filling his cup. Something needs to take his place. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. For real. It sucks, but it's also it's salvation. We're, we're working that out. <laughs> we're in that process. I'm really curious to see what that thing will be. Will it be matching Thor's idea or will it, is it possible that he can surpass it in some way? Yeah, it feels that way sometimes. <laughs> Projection Asklad is admittedly very much like real Asklad. I'm trying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, like everything else, is Thorfinn's projection. This is guilt. I think if you do something wrong and the consequences are worse for the victim than for you, let's say you get out unscathed, there's a weird scale that gives you pain where you feel like you got away with something that you shouldn't have gotten away with, that you're like waiting for cosmic punishment or something. But while it's debatable what true justice is, that thing itself is a punishment. That is cosmic retribution. Not all punishment is material. That's your burden to carry. But that's also a guiding hand. You could think of it as some kind of cosmic force that is seeking to balance scales. Because while you can't undo the things you've done, you can't undo wrongdoing, if done well, if fully listened to, paid attention to, that corrects you into something or someone that is seeking to do good. And you pay your penance through the suffering and then the action that the suffering leads to, which is hopefully service or something thing that is positive and so you make that contribution you pay with your your soul your suffering and then your action he looks so defeated he's got to find something i don't know you can start by apologizing i'm really i, I mean i can't fathom the gravity of the, of the whole thing So damn sad. Ass, I just let up. <laughs> Still kicking ass. Oh, wow. Wow. Projection ass led. Still working to free him. Projection ass led speaks the truth. Damn. Ass led still, still crushing it from the grave. It's the character that keeps on giving. Doesn't feel so empty now. Oh, what was I? Was I making noise in my sleep again? Wasn't too bad, was it? Wakes up reaching for the heavens. This must be still a dream, because I know Aner didn't leave him like that. Oh, Aner's just... <laughs> Aner's also just passed out from fatigue. This was a true battle. Aner fighting physically for his right to exist. Thorfinn fighting spiritually for his right to exist. God. We did it. <laughs> we did a lot. Honestly, we did, we did so much. I, I don't even know the half of it. We did. We we yeah. 
wow, big turning point. I feel better about whatever is going to come from this attack without even knowing, seeing what they've both gone through just now. I know maybe a little bit less grand in scale, but huge for him in that he's been a victim for so long, he's been powerless. His assigned mission was to stay alive, but he's standing up for what he believes in. Thorfinn, obviously, this whole whole thing, whole deep thing. A big question for me still about Thorfinn is what does it turn into? Because like I've talked about in a lot of shows, a very common thing you see in these ultimate hero stories is there's an ideal and there's an evil. The hero manages to overcome the evil by using the ideals, but also critically having some personal insight where it's not just a uh, rehashing of the ideas or reiteration of things that they've learned, but it's something synthesized, something new that is unique to them, that is their contribution. So it's not only carrying the legacy of the great people that came before you, but carrying the legacy, maintaining the legacy, and then making your own contribution in a way that harmonizes two extremes and pushes something forward into a new paradigm. I think this was him internalizing Thor's pacifism and Thor's there is no enemy which is such a key insight. But then the question is, what does Thorfinn do with that? Thor's death is still somewhat confusing to me because it was so clear that his arc was complete, that it was the end of his journey and that he was the greatest man he could be. There was also something a little bit unsatisfying about it, which was the capitulation. What does Thorfinn do? How does Thorfinn take this and actually have a cause, you know, actually stand for something, not hide from the world, be a messenger of high ideals, maybe, while using all the insight he's gained about destruction, carnage, wanting peace. Whatever the case may be, I think it's pretty clear to say that Thorfinn is no longer empty. Asklad's words were him speaking to himself, you know, you have to fight. This kind of awakening feels like a curse at first, but ultimately contains so much raw potential because now you can see, you know, finally you can see with clarity. Part of what you can see is what you have to do, and it's terrifying. You are in control. You have much more responsibility for yourself. There's no one to blame. There are no excuses, no easy outs. There's just work. There's just fighting a fight constantly. But in that contains one's arc, you know, one's journey to greatness. I think that fight actually also went really well because nothing really bad happened. I mean, they got their asses kicked. Yet it feels optimistic. Why is that? It'll be interesting to see how people respond to this, yeah. <laughs> he's just he's feeling good. <laughs> and we got each other. We had each other's backs. Yes and no. Yeah. Having that same image again and again. Whoa. Wow. And you know that comes from such a real place. Maybe you can face doors now. <laughs> I know Jax is so great. It's like, whatever it is, I got your back. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got it. I had a feeling. No one likes you, you suck. Whoops. You blew it. You don't goof, son. This is what really came through. I was a little bit too harsh on him originally. Not an empty man. Oath. Wow, that episode was so beautiful. It occurs to me, hearing the line about <laughs> my hopes were gone again, that this is a really great beginning. There are going to be a lot of tests to this. It's not going to be easy, but it's such a liberating empowering first step. There's just so much to it. Like I was saying before about penance, I mean, this is the karmic cost. It was this or just live in hell. You either stay there forever and it just burns your soul or you turn it into something and you live with the knowledge that you can't erase the harm you've done, but you try to add something. You try to add more than you've detracted. And in a way I can't explain, that almost is some kind of force, some kind of cosmic or divine force. Speaking of it in terms of heaven and hell, which we got in this episode, one way of conceptualizing it is that heaven is the state you live when you are fully in harmony with the forces of existence, with the objective truth of reality that, as crazy as this might sound to say and as hard as this is to explain, has something like a will in the sense that it has rules and it has a direction. Tough to pin it down exactly, but I would argue it is things like potential, 
fostering potential, creation, struggling and winning against the natural forces of decay and destruction and atrophy so that things are building and growing and becoming more complex, taking all the raw elements and synthesizing them to their maximum so that the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And hell is something like the opposite. It's destruction for no gain. It's destruction for destruction's sake. It's that that limits instead of grows, that that tears down rather than builds. And so if you take that interpretation and thinking about this kind of thing in that light, if you're fortunate enough to be able to learn that you have independence and that you are in control of yourself that up to that point it's kind of luck but once you get that insight that it's me i can grow i can learn and that's in my hands the evil or the journey towards hell for the right people has a way of correcting into something like heaven and like the analogy i, I provided earlier it's gonna be a little bit unnatural you know it's gonna take energy it's going to be a struggle against the natural decay the, the natural forces of destruction but there's something about that that's like divine heroism that the heroism that we see and experience is backed by some greater force it's not arbitrary it's connected to that kind of heaven that kind of that universal essence or whatever it is but it takes sacrifice going back to my rhetorical question at the beginning of this episode i'm thinking about the image of thorfinn with the lamb he was in a state of paradise but was that truly heaven the lamb maybe is him you know it's total innocence it's not really strength it's not heroism him going out of hell right? He's not going back to the same place. He's not going to that innocent garden. He's going out into a land of sin, but he's meeting it head on and he now has a higher vision than he ever could have had. It's tough and perhaps it's a mistake to try to do some kind of accounting and decide what's better or worse. But what I can say, what I do feel is that Thorfinn now is better than he ever has been. He's closer than he ever has been and he's going to be capable of some truly amazing things. Even though it might feel impossible to him now, it's even possible that he surpassed his father. Or since I think one's arc is unique to oneself, not to compare them, he can be a better Thorfinn than just a Thorfinn who perpetuates his father's ideals. Overall, just an amazing episode, and I think, at least from where I'm, I'm sitting, having just watched it, my favorite of season two so far.